Now let me talk about coronary blood flow, or at least an introduction. First, let's talk about myocardial oxygen consumption. And it is very high. About 70% of the oxygen delivered is extracted by the heart. This leads to a low venous PO2, approximately 20 millimeters of mercury leaving the heart. The normal mixed venous PO2 is about 40 millimeters of mercury, so this is low. And this leads to a very high arterial venous oxygen difference. About 70% of the myocardial oxygen consumption is due to muscle contraction. Also, there's some vessel compression that occurs during systole. And as the blood flow is cut off to the subendocardial muscle cells, it's compensated for by the release of oxygen from myoglobin to allow the muscles to maintain their contractile force. During exercise, however, high cardiac work, along with a short diastolic period may lead to a noticeable ischemia, and that could be visible on an electrocardiogram. So let's talk about that vessel compression. If we look at the vessels, we have the epicardial arteries here, transmural arteries coming down here, and then the subendocardial plexus of blood vessels. During systole, what happens is the subendocardial region is becoming compressed, and that compression restricts blood flow to these myocytes down here. This subendocardial compression leads to a squeeze, and that squeeze may actually push the blood back up to the epicardial region. At this point, because the subendocardial region is now not receiving blood supply, they rely on myoglobin oxygen stores to supply the muscles with the oxygen needed to maintain contraction. Now, during diastole, blood flow is restored to the subendocardium, myoglobin is now reloaded, and we're ready to go for another beat. Looking at this figure here, the pressure in the left ventricle is very low, only a few millimeters of mercury. At the beginning of contraction, we see the pressure rising. We call this isovolumetric contraction because blood's not leaving yet. Blood can't leave the heart until the aortic valve opens at this point here. Once the pressure rises above, arterial or aortic pressure. The valve now opens, blood is ejected, it slows down toward the end of its systole, and then at this point right here, the aortic valves close. And now we go through an isovolumetric relaxation. Again, no blood's moving. Pressure's dropping as the heart's relaxing until the pressure drops low enough to allow the venous pressure feeding the atria to push the mitral valves open, and now we see the filling of the ventricles once again. So we see in the aortic pressure here, the diastolic period, on average about 80 millimeters of mercury, the valve pushes open and comes back down here and the valve closes. This is our systolic pressure, the peak pressure. So we've got diastolic and systolic pressure. And then we see what's called a dichrotic notch here. That is, there's a reflection wave. Once the valve closes, blood sort of reflected back. And right at the valve, there's actually a slight, and I'm not showing it here, there's actually a slight spike right at this point. If you could get a pressure transducer right up at the valve, you'd see a very sharp spike followed by this little hump in this point here. Now, if we look at the right coronary blood flow, it tends to match the aortic pressure. We see the diastolic period. We see a rapid increase in flow relating to the increase in pressure. We see this bump once again, and then the diastolic period. In the left ventricle, however, we see something different. At this point, we're looking at isovolumetric contraction. So there's our diastolic period. We see a sudden drop in blood flow. Remember, that's the squeeze going on. Blood flow is going down because of compression. Once the aortic valve opens, and I'll put some lines in here now for you. This first line is the point at which the isovolumetric contraction begins, we see now this drop in pressure because of the squeeze. This next line represents the point at which the aortic valve opens and blood is ejected. We do see a partial recovery because as blood is leaving the left ventricle, there's a little less pressure against the endocardium, relieving some of the pressure, allowing some of that blood to return. And at this point, the aortic valve now just closed, we see a rapid increase in blood flow, and then followed by the diastolic period at this point. 
What I'm showing here is this represents a completely unobstructed, clear coronary artery. Now we see a 20%, 40, 60, 80, and a completely occluded or obstructed coronary artery. And up here we're looking at the relative blood flow relative to the demand. So this is another example of supply and demand. Blood flow supplies oxygen, myocardial cells demand it. At rest, we can see we can reach almost 80% obstruction and not see a large reduction in supply relative to the demand. We see a sudden drop off as we go beyond that point. But at maximum coronary blood flow during sustained activity, we see up until about 40% occlusion, no loss in supply. Blood supply to the muscle cells is maintained. We're seeing a slight drop here at around 40 and then a rapid increase in our fall off. So blood flow is rapidly decreasing as the obstruction becomes larger. In this diagram, I'm showing an example of laminar flow. Laminar flow really only occurs in the very smallest vessels because the diameter of the larger vessels leads to turbulence. However, if there's an obstruction, what happens is the blood has to run through a narrow opening, and to do that, it has to speed up. The velocity has to increase. Once it exits that obstruction, there's a rapid reduction in velocity leading to turbulence. If I look at a blood vessel and I record the pressure a small distance apart, and I look at blood flow, and I monitor coronary blood flow and the pressure difference between P1 and P2. I'll see a fairly linear increase in the pressure owing to the resistance between the two pressure transducers. If, on the other hand, I place an obstruction in there, we see now this pressure here is building up, trying to drive the blood through this narrow opening. Suddenly the pressure in P2 drops again, and we see a large difference between the pressure at P1 and the pressure at P2, and we see this somewhat exponential increase in the pressure difference because of this denotic region. Let's look at autoregulation. This is local control. Let's assume that I have a vessel that cannot constrict. It's fully dilated and will stay so. And I increase the perfusion pressure. We see coronary blood flow rising, rising all this time, and it'll eventually start to curve off. If I now fully constrict those vessels and don't allow them to dilate, and I do the same experiment, I see, again, as perfusion pressure increases, we see an increase in coronary blood flow, but this increase is much less steep. Normally, however, we see something like this, an increase in blood flow until about 60 millimeters of mercury, then we see the blood flow starting to taper off, and we see a somewhat flattened region we call the autoregulation region. It finally reaches, at about 160 millimeters of mercury, a point at which it can no longer constrict anymore, we are maximally constricted. So this region we call an autoregulation zone. The reason that's happening is the smooth muscles are beginning to constrict as they're being stretched because of the increase in the perfusion pressure, the transmural pressure from inside the vessel to outside the vessel is beginning to stretch the vessel. That stress is inducing smooth muscle contraction, causing vessel constriction, leading to this somewhat plateau phase, controlling coronary blood flow at a particular region. This, by the way, occurs in vessels outside of the heart as well. Now, if I put a obstruction in the vessel, what we see in the maximally dilated vessel, we see a much less steep curve, which begins to curve off sooner as well. So, once again, we're now seeing blood flow rising as perfusion pressure rises, we still find a point at which the system autoregulates, and then we see again the maximally constricted region. This also leaves us a problem. We have less vasodilator reserve. That is, this system cannot vasodilate as well as an open system because the smooth muscles here are trying to dilate, but the obstruction just simply cannot allow blood flow to pass through at the same rate that would occur without the obstruction. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about angina pectoris. This is a sudden, severe chest pain, pressing chest pain. It begins substernally, but it may radiate to the left arm, and then sometimes even up to the jaw. And this is a problem with the supply and demand. The heart is demanding oxygen, but the supply is being reduced. Risk factors include age, males 
also have a higher risk of angina or angina, as some people also say. Obesity, smoking, diabetes, these can all affect the chest pain. But there's not a very good relationship between the severity of the chest pain and the supply issue. Severe chest pain could be seen with a minimal disruption of supply. But you may also find very little chest pain, even in severe cases. There's a lot of individual variability. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the four types of angina. Stable angina, unstable, microvascular, and Prince Metals angina. First, stable angina. Stable angina occurs because the plaque causing the obstruction is stable. That means it's calcified and it's unlikely to rupture. We also call that an effort angina. It's precipitated by activity. As you exercise, as the demand goes up, supply cannot keep up with it and you feel that chest pain. Once you are at rest, the chest pain is not there because, as you remember from the figure I showed earlier, at rest, the obstruction just does not reduce blood flow enough to become a factor. And also, after the cessation of activity, symptoms disappear. Once you're back at rest and activity goes down, supply then can keep up with demand. Unstable angina, which we also call acute coronary syndrome, occurs when the angina worsens. We also call it crescendo angina. It's unstable because the plaque is unstable. This is a softer plaque, and it is susceptible to rupturing. If it ruptures, a thrombus will form, and that thrombus will then cause an obstruction. Ischemia occurs. You will sense this severe acute pain. It can even occur at rest because the thrombus can occur at any time the plaque ruptures. Crescendo because each time it gets a little bit worse. Microvascular, sometimes called syndrome X. We don't know why, but probably it's because of these poorly functioning small blood vessels in the heart. But they can also occur in the arms and the legs. The moment we're concerned about the heart. Because there's no arterial blockage, we can't diagnose it easily. You can do an angiogram and find no blockage. But there's good prognosis. This tends not to progress as a result. You just have to modify your activity. If you do find angina occurring during exercise, you can just reduce your level of exercise. Prince Metals angina, this is another variant. The coronary vessels don't show any sclerotic tissue. You can run an angiogram and you won't find anything. And we think this is probably because of coronary artery spasms. The smooth muscles just suddenly contract for unknown reasons. That sudden contraction leads to a reduction in supply. As a result, the demand is high, supply has suddenly gone down, and you feel that chest pain. So let's talk for a moment about acute coronary syndrome. This is also referred to as unstable angina. A rupture of an unstable plaque causes a thrombus to form. These clots will resolve over time, but the damage depends on the size of the clot that's created and the rate at which it dissolves. As opposed to the rate of clot formation, if they're forming rapidly and they're dissolving slowly, you will get sustained ischemia, or if the clot is large, you will get a sustained ischemia, which then is a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And this leads to necrosis. Cells downstream of the obstruction are dying. So let's summarize. We have an atherosclerotic plaque. If it's a stable plaque, you have stable angina. Just because it's stable doesn't mean you don't need to have it treated. You may need to have a stent put in or take nitroglycerin to try to reduce the constriction in vessels or possibly even coronary artery bypass. If it's an unstable plaque, you now have acute coronary syndrome. It may be transient. That means the clot forms, you get the pain, the clot dissolves, the pain goes away. If it's a sustained ischemia, you have a myocardial infarct. You have a heart attack. That leads to necrosis, and necrosis means cells are dying. However, a transient ischemia can also lead to sustained ischemia. Assuming the clots are forming rapidly enough or they're not dissolving fast enough, you can then produce a sustained ischemia or a myocardial infarct. So even transient ischemia does need attention because transient ischemic attacks tend to increase in frequency and intensity. Well, that's a brief discussion of coronary blood flow.